Well, hello and welcome to The Zone. I'm your host, Big Wave Dave. So today we're going to talk about dinosaurs. You know, dinosaurs were some of the coolest creatures that ever roamed the earth. They're amazing. But you know, people have different ideas about dinosaurs. For example, evolutionists believe that dinosaurs evolved over millions of years. They believe that they lived and died millions of years before humans appeared on the earth. They also believe that most dinosaurs were wiped out by some event, perhaps an asteroid hitting the earth. And they also believe that some dinosaurs evolved into birds. You know, as a Christian, I have a totally different view on dinosaurs. I believe that dinosaurs were created on day six of creation week. Why? Because they're land animals and that's when God created land animals. I also believe that most dinosaurs were wiped out in the global flood and that the survivors couldn't find food and were hunted to extinction. Now, I gotta admit, the first time I heard this view, I felt like this. It's like, dude, really? I mean, what a weird idea. You got any evidence for that? No, there is no evidence for a global flood because we do have tons of proof all over the world that it never happened. Pioneers in geology set about finding evidence of a flood and found instead overwhelming volumes of evidence everywhere to indicate successive periods of geologic prehistory. It doesn't matter what it says in the Bible, because we know that story was adopted and adapted from elder mythology, inspired by a localized event in an Iraqi floodplain. Whatever truth there was to that tale was lost as it was embellished over centuries and exaggerated the way these type stories usually are. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's get started. So, is the word dinosaur in the Bible? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? If you said no, you're right. The word dinosaur is not in the Bible. And here's why. The word dinosaur is a new word. It wasn't created until hundreds of years after most versions of the Bible were written. However, Experts believe that dinosaurs may have been called by a different name. Do you know what it is? If you said dragons, you're right. Wrong. There are no experts in any relevant field who believe such a thing. Nor are there any historic documents or artifacts to support that either. Everyone who, centuries ago, used the word dragon, described lizards or snakes or similar animals and fanciful exaggerations thereof. None of those people living hundreds of years ago knew anything at all about dinosaurs, and that is obvious when you study any one or all of those legends. Here's what's really interesting. The Hebrew word tanin, which can be translated dragon, is found over 20 times in the King James Version of the Bible. And let's not forget about this guy, the behemoth. So just to give you a little background, Job is having a really bad day. He's lost his wealth, his health, He's lost his kids. I mean, it's just a terrible day. So, you know, he and his friends start to question God. Now, God decides to humble Job by asking him a bunch of questions. Like, where were you when I created? And he goes through a whole bunch of different things. And when he gets to 4015, he mentions a creature called Behemoth. So who or what is Behemoth? Now, in my Bible, down at the bottom, there's these little notes, they're called footnotes. And they say that behemoth was probably a hippo or an elephant. Now here's something you need to keep in mind. Those notes at the bottom of the page are somebody's opinion about what scripture says. So we're gonna look at actual scripture, the word of God to see what it says, okay? Here we go. So the first thing we learn, look at behemoth, which I made along with you. So whatever behemoth was, he was made on the same day as humans were created. The next thing we learn is that behemoth feeds on grass like an ox. So it's a vegetarian. And again, lots of animals eat grass. So obviously we need to keep going. Next thing we find out in 4015 is that he has strength he has in his loins, what power he has in the muscles of his belly. Boy, that's weird. What does that mean? That means that behemoth has a big belly, kind of like the one I'm working on here, right? Well, elephants have a big belly, right? And hippos have a big belly. This guy has a big belly, but I can tell you this, I guarantee you 
That guy is not behemoth. What about this guy? He's got a huge belly. Why, you and your friends could hang out all night inside that belly. Good thing he eats plants. Let's keep going. This is perhaps the most important clue. God said that behemoth has a tail that sways like a cedar tree. Have you ever been camping and seen cedar trees? They're big, beautiful trees. So let's keep going here. Let's see. Do elephants have tails like cedars? I don't think so. What about hippo? Does he have a tail like a cedar tree? Are you kidding me? Look at that. Hippos and elephants do not have tails like cedar trees. Therefore, we know right now that whatever behemoth was, it was not a hippo or an elephant. What about this guy? He's got a huge tail. If you didn't get out of the way of that thing, it could knock you into next week. Verse 15 tells us, Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. The Hebrew word behemoth used in this text simply means the largest of animals. The remains of the seropod dinosaur are the largest found in the fossil record. The elephant is the largest land animal living on this earth today. The elephant also eats grass as an ox. So far, the biblical description could fit both the seropod and the elephant. Verse 17 reads, He moveth his tail like a cedar, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Starting with this verse, young earth creationists begin to modify God's word to fit their preconceived idea that this animal is a dinosaur. Young earthers accuse old earth creationists of trying to fit preconceived ideas based on science into the biblical text, when in fact, they are the ones guilty of this practice. What does this verse say? It says, He moveth his tail like a cedar. The original Hebrew word for moveth is kofetz. It is an action verb, not a descriptive adjective. It is not describing what the tail looks like, it is describing the movement action of the tail. It means to bend or to sway. Yet young earth lecturers continue to modify this portion of scripture. It is always described as a huge tail that looks like a cedar tree. Its bones are big, its body is big, I mean everything about that creature is big and it has an enormous tail as well. If you read the description of it, it sounds an awful lot like a sauropod dinosaur, one of the dinosaurs that had the very long neck and long tail and broad body. Wait a minute, his tail's like a cedar tree? Have you ever seen an elephant's tail? <laughs> Not like a cedar tree. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a hippo tail? Not like a cedar tree. And he moves his tail like a cedar, an enormous tail. Does that look like a cedar to you? In Tennessee, we say that's a pretty sorry cedar. <laughs> Look, here's a tail to me that looks like a cedar tree. Let's back it onto an elephant and say, I don't think so. The name Diplodocus means double beam, referring to the long muscles along its belly to support its very long neck and very long tail. Verse 17, he moves his tail like a cedar. That's a tree. He's got a tail like a, like a cedar tree. Really amazing. Whether it is Ken Ham, Dr. Jason Lyle, or any of the other answers in Genesis speakers, the exact same words are used. This is where I have a major problem with the Young Earth Movement. The Bible says nothing about a huge tail. And it has an enormous tail as well. One of the dinosaurs that had the very long neck and long tail. An enormous tail. To support its very long neck and very long tail. When Kent Hovind and Tommy Mitchell give their presentations, they show a graphic of verse 17. Instead of the emphasis being on the word moveth, the words, his tail like a cedar, is highlighted. The word moveth, the most important word in this verse, is ignored. Ken Ham shows cartoons of an elephant and a hippo with extremely long tapered tails, implying that the description of the tail in the Bible doesn't fit an elephant or hippopotamus. But Ken Ham has made another huge mistake by trying to fit his preconceived ideas into the Bible text. That mistake is his preconceived idea of the cedar tree being described in this verse. For argument's sake, let's pretend that the scripture is giving a description of a cedar tree. 
It's not, but let's pretend it is. The young earth creationist perception of the cedar tree being mentioned in Job is not the cedar tree they are thinking of. There is only one type of cedar tree that fits the description Ken Ham gives in his lectures. The western red cedar, native to the area of Montana in the United States, looks similar to the giant redwood sequoia trees of California. This has to be the cedar tree that Ken Ham is referring to. But this cedar tree is native only to the North American continent and a small area of Australia. This tree is not native to the Middle East, and there is no evidence that it ever has been. Ken Ham is using the description of a tree that didn't exist in Job's day where Job resided. The cedar tree mentioned in Job 40 is the Lebanese cedar tree, which still exists today and was common in the Middle East during Job's time. The Lebanese cedar tree consists of a long, wiry trunk with a clump of branches at the top. The wood consists of a flexible fiber causing the tree to sway in the breeze much more than any other tree in that area. An adult elephant's tail is, on an average, about six to eight feet long and weighs between 20 and 30 pounds, with a clump of wiry hair at the end that it uses to swat flies. When the elephant walks, the tail sways back and forth, strikingly similar to the movement of a Lebanese cedar tree swaying in the wind. The tail bends. Ken Ham has taken his own preconceived ideas about what Job is describing and tries to modify God's Word to fit his ideas. Again, let's say that Ken Ham's interpretation of the description of the tail is correct. A seropod's tail doesn't look anything like a Lebanese cedar tree. In fact, if you put an elephant's tail next to a Lebanese cedar tree, you'll see more of a similarity between these two than what the young earthers are proposing. Remember, the Bible doesn't describe what the tail looks like. It describes the movement of the tail. But if it was describing what the tail looked like, it's describing a Lebanese cedar tree. Followers of the young earth creationist rely solely on the word of people like Ken Ham instead of researching for themselves whether the information they are receiving is accurate. They sit in one of the lecturers given by the Answers in Genesis staff look at graphics shown of a seropod dinosaur's tail, and are misled into believing that God's Word is saying the tail of behemoth looks like a cedar tree when the text says nothing of the sort. But even if it did, the tail of the elephant looks just like a Lebanese cedar tree. Along with this blatant misrepresentation, Young Earth lectures also imply that the creature has a long neck. The name Diplodocus means double beam, referring to the long muscles along its belly to support its very long neck and very long tail. I have dissected the original Hebrew text that describes this animal, and there is not one reference in Scripture about the animal's neck. There are references to its loins, belly, tail, bones, mouth, and nose. There is absolutely no reference to the animal's neck. This omission in the Bible is probably because there is nothing that stands out about an elephant's neck. In fact, it hardly has one. Yet the Young Earth Movement continues to claim the animal has a long neck. This claim is totally unsubstantiated in Scripture. The book of Job is the conflict area here because many people believe Behemoth and Leviathan were dinosaurs. The word Behemoth Behemoth just simply means the largest of beasts, the brute beast par excellence. Whatever the biggest beast was that got off the ark with Noah is the behemoth. It, it could be a dinosaur, sure, but as you might have guessed uh, from the slide here, uh, I'm going to contend that it is the elephant. The behemoth is the elephant. These 20 Bible commentators of yesteryear all believe that the behemoth was either the elephant or the hippo. So the first point I have, and I have four to convince you that the elephant is the behemoth, is that in Job 40 and verse 17, where it says that the behemoth moves its tail like a cedar, that is an action verb. 
the tail like the cedar is the main objection that people have to the behemoth being an elephant. If you listen to Ken Ham and, and other individuals, they'll show you elef uh, pictures of the elephant and they'll say, that's, that's not a cedar. That's not the size of a cedar at all. And then they'll show a dinosaur and they'll show the giant tail of a dinosaur and, and they'll say, that is a cedar tail. But my point is that uh, this is an action verb. It moves like a cedar, not an adjective. In other words, the Bible is not saying the behemoth's tail is as big as a cedar. Rather, it is saying the movement is like a cedar. And that is a very important point. And God is using hyperbole here when he says like a cedar. Just a few verses earlier in describing the horse, God uses hyperbole. He says, have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Did God literally clothe, clothe the horse's neck with thunder? Obviously, no. That's expressive imagery. It is conscious exaggeration for the sake of effect. And I believe that's what's going on with the description of the behemoth's tail in this place. Here is uh, the meaning of, again, it's a verb. He straightens his tail like a cedar. And here are some of the translations. Uh, you may have read these before. ESV says, he makes his tail stiff like a cedar. NIV Berean, his tail sways like a cedar. NASB, bends like a cedar. ISV, his tail pro protrudes stiffly like a cedar. Is there any way that the elephant does this, that it uh, bends its tail or stiffens its tail like a cedar? Just so happens there is. If you're a tourist and you're going to Africa on safari, you're going to be taught the elephant warning signals in case you uh, have a conversation with a bull elephant. The elephant, if they're angry, will stomp the ground, flap their ears, shake their head, trumpet loudly, and number four on this list, they will stiffen their tail. And if you see that, then you get out of there because the elephant is about to stomp you into the ground. And so this is a widely known aspect of the elephant. Here's a painting from Warfare in India. And you can see here this charging elephant has stiffened its tail. This was the last thing that many Roman soldiers saw before Hannibal's Carthaginian elephants turned them into uh, Latin pulp. So, and a side, a side point here I wanted to make is that elephants were used by the ancient Chinese, the Indian Empire, the Persians. Alexander the Great had 85 elephants. Ptolemy the Egyptian had elephants. The Romans even used elephants, and we have meticulous records of the warfare of these ancient uh, nations. But do you know what no ancient army ever used in warfare? A dinosaur. Never once did a brontosaur or a sauropod or a triceratops charge the infantry. It didn't happen. But it did happen with elephants. Here's a man in Thailand praying for his life after elephants attacked him and his moped. And notice the elephant's tails. Uh, the adult elephant has a stiff tail. The teenage uh, elephant has a stiff tail. They're not happy at all. And this man is praying for his life to the elephants. You've heard of the right hand of fellowship? This is the stiff tail of anger. This unfortunate man is finding out that this is a warning sign that you don't want to ignore. So, the point of this being, sure, you could apply this to a sauropod, dinosaur, but it applies also to the elephant. And saying that it doesn't is inserting something in the scripture uh, that isn't necessarily true. This in itself, I agree, doesn't prove it to be the elephant. But I think you can accept that elephants are known to stiffen their tails like a cedar. So God goes on to say in 4018 that behemoth has bones like tubes of bronze and his limbs are like rods of iron. Whatever behemoth is, he's got really big bones. So I'd like to show you a couple of my favorite fossils. This is the toe bone of a Brachiosaurus. The toe bone! Wow! These creatures were huge! Now this one here is a vertebrae or a backbone of a large plant-eating dinosaur called a Camarasaurus. Now just to give you an idea, a little reference point, our vertebrae are probably about that big. You can see from the size of this just how massive these creatures were. Again, who is taking their preconceived ideas and forcing them into the biblical text? Verse 18 
is an excellent example of divine inspiration in the biblical text. When these words were penned, the writer probably did not even understand himself what he was writing, but God was inspiring the words. And when God describes the bones of Behemoth, he was describing elephant bones with clues that have just recently been discovered by science. Elephant bones are unique because of the size of their bodies. Normal bones would break under the weight of the massive bodies of these animals. So God designed the bones with two distinct properties, strength and flexibility. The bones need to be strong enough to support the weight, but flexible enough not to break when the animal is moving or running. Verse 18 reads, His bones are as strong pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. Notice what this verse is saying. God is comparing Bohemus bones to two different types of metals. The word brass, translated from the original Hebrew text, is nikosha, which is actually copper. It is a soft metal that was refined by ancient Hebrews to be used in applications where bending or forming the metal was important. The next description of Bohemus bones is with the word barzel. This word is correctly translated as iron, a rigid, strong metal used in Job's time to make strong tools and nails. Once refined, this metal was rigid and hard, very difficult to bend. But again, the Young Earth Lectures are misrepresenting what God's Word says in this verse. In their presentations, they proclaim facts that are not given in God's Word concerning the size of Bohemus bones. The Bible says, his bones are as strong pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. He had big bones, and they did. I've got one here on the table. This is a copy of a toe bone from a brachiosaur. Now kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The reason he had such big toe bones is because he had big toes. The Bible says nothing about the size of the bones. The verse is describing the properties of the bones. Yet the young earth audiences are made to believe that the verse is describing the bones of a huge dinosaur. And while we're on the subject of large animals, let's examine the next verse. He is the chief in the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. The original Hebrew word for chief is reshith, and it simply means first in rank. In the context of this verse, it means the largest of land animals. Young Earth creationists claim that this is the seropod dinosaur, which is the largest extinct animal in the fossil record. But the elephant is the largest land animal alive today. And we're going to show why the elephant is the animal being described in Job chapter 40. Secondly, God gave Behemoth a sword. <clears throat> verse 19 is translated, uh, he is the first of the ways of God, only he who made him can bring near his sword. An alternative uh, translation of this verse is found here in the word biblical commentary, he that hath made him hath furnished him with a sword. In other words, God gave behemoth his sword. And the ASV, which is very literal, uses this, he only that made him giveth him his sword. God gave him a sword. Darby, he that made him gave him a sword. And I want you to notice <clears throat> the elephant's tusks. God gave the behemoth a sword, a modified incisor tooth, which is huge and sword-like. That is a sword. And remember, this is a grass eater. What's a grass eater doing with a sword? God gave it to him. Sauropod dinosaurs don't have swords. They have flat, small teeth, relatively small, that are not like swords at all. So, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us what behemoth was, but if you look at the rest of scriptures, it sure seems to be describing what we would call a large sauropod dinosaur. I'll give Ken Ham and the rest of the young earth creationists the benefit of the doubt up to this point that they simply have a lack of knowledge when it comes to what the Bible is actually telling us about Bohemoth. I'll concede the possibility that young earthers don't know that the giant cedar tree never existed in Job's environment. 
I'll give them a pass on their incorrect assumption that the Bible mentions a long neck when it doesn't. There's a good chance that they have never heard of the recent scientific evidence of the two properties of elephant bones that substantiates the description given in verse 18. But here is where I believe the deliberate deception begins to take place. In every one of the presentations given by any of the lecturers from Answers in Genesis, the description always ends at verse 19. Every one of the Answers in Genesis staff abruptly in their interpretation of God's Word at verse 19. But the description continues through verse 24. So why would anyone decide to omit verses 20 through 24? By examining what these verses say, I think you will come to the same conclusion that I have. The remaining verses eliminate any doubt as to what animal this chapter is describing, and it's not a seropod dinosaur. In Job chapter 40, verses 21 and 22, we read, He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The original Hebrew word for shady tree is tishel. It is describing another tree native to Job's environment, the lotus tree. This tree is only mentioned in these two verses. It is commonly accepted by biblical scholars and scientists alike that this tree is the ancient Sisyphus lotus tree, which is included in about 40 species of small trees in the buckthorn family. Some of the trees in this family are deciduous, others are evergreen. The three well-known species are the jujube in southeastern Asia, the lotus from the Mediterranean region, and the bearer which is found from western Africa to India. The modern-day lotus tree growing in the Mediterranean area looks something like this. It reaches a height of no more than 30 feet tall and is close in shape and size to the lotus tree described in Job. The Brachiosaurus serapon stood 60 feet tall from ground to head. The Supersaurus serapod averaged a length of 108 to 112 feet long and stood 70 feet high from the ground to the head. The Amphicolius fragilimus species of the serapod grew to a length of 190 feet long and stood 90 feet high from ground to head. By comparison, the giraffe, the tallest of all living animals today, averages from 16 to 18 feet tall. In this demonstration, we are going to use the words of the young earth creationists to choose the dinosaur they say is described in Job chapter 40. Its bones are big, its body is big, I mean everything about that creature is big, and it has an enormous tail as well. In fact, it's the chief in the ways of God, which means the largest land animal God made. That's what verse 19 really means. The largest of any dinosaur on earth stood approximately 90 feet tall. Let's take the lotus tree, which grew to a height of 30 feet, and place it next to that dinosaur. How in the world is the lotus tree going to cover him with their shadow? Even if the seropod dinosaur was laying down, it would be difficult to position itself under the lotus tree. On the other hand, you can find elephants, averaging about 12 feet tall, standing under trees all the time. It's a common habit of elephants to shade themselves from the hot sun. What would happen if a sauropod dinosaur tried to get under that tree? That tree would be uprooted and destroyed. Here's a diagrammatic representation of a titanosaur next to the Statue of Liberty and a 25-foot tree. Uh, this description doesn't work for the sauropod. The behemoth has to be the largest land animal ever. And by the way, sauropods are now up to 30 meters, according to paleontologists, in height. And the sauropod doesn't fit beneath the Jordan River's lotus tree. You turn this animal to its side, it's 130 feet long. The scrubby foliage of the Jordan River isn't going to cut it. Another important point about the lotus tree is that it does not thrive in swamps. 
Although it does grow near rivers and streams, the root structure of this tree survives best in moderately moist soil, with the roots extending down as far as 30 feet into the ground to get its moisture. Lotus trees die if the ground they are on is flooded for an extended period of time. This fact conflicts with the assertion by young earth creationists that Bohemoth lives in a swamp. There is an effort to make young earthers believe that the words in the covert of the reed and fens prove that this animal lived in the swamp. You know what covert means. What is a covert agent? A covert agent is a secret agent. And he's in that uh, marsh and reeds where he is covered. He's secret in that place. Again, perfect for the elephant, but I would contend impossible for the, uh, for the dinosaur. And then fourthly, the elephant snorkels in the flooded Jordan. Verse 23 says, Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth. The raging Jordan doesn't bother the behemoth. He's confident even though there's water in his mouth. There's turbulence, there's flooding, and he doesn't give a care in the world. Now, let me ask you, what, mam what air-breathing mammal is that true of? If you get water in your mouth, are you afraid of drowning? Any air-breathing mammal is. And we're going to answer how the elephant fits this picture in a minute. But first, consider how deep did the Jordan get? We know from Joshua 3.15 that the Jordan overflowed its banks when Mount Hermon uh, flooded the area in spring. When the Israelites crossed the Jordan, it was a mile wide, but only 12 feet deep. So when God uh, divided the Jordan, he divided a mile wide Jordan that was only 12 feet deep. Here is a sauropod. And uh, this is 12 feet here. You can see the people down here. So this might be actually a little over 12 feet. This is as deep as the Jordan River gets in the flood. And you can see it's not even up to the shoulders of this creature. Here's double the depth of the flood of Jordan, and it's at the shoulders. Here is the animal's head way up here. I ask you, when is the flooded Jordan ever going to be a problem for the sauropod? When is the water going to get in the sauropod's mouth? Never, because the Jordan is too shallow for this creature uh, to even really swim in. So let's go back to the elephant. I, I said earlier most of the commentators say the hippo is uh, the behemoth. And why did they say that? Because the word demands the largest land mammal that got off the ark, the first of God's work. They said it because they didn't understand that the elephant is aquatic. They thought the hippo was a better answer, even though it's smaller, because the hippo is aquatic. They thought the elephant was a creature of the plains of the savanna, and uh, they didn't think the elephant was at home in the water. But you know what we found out in just the last few years? We found out that the elephant has a marvelous anatomic uh, change, and this is Physiology 2002. The elephant is the only mammal whose pleural space, that's the space around your lungs, is obliterated by connective tissue. This has been known for 300 years, but never explained. The elephant is the only animal that can snorkel at depth. Just recently explained. The elephant is a Navy SEAL expert snorkeler. And the old time commentators, they didn't, they didn't know that. They didn't know that about the elephant. Young Earthers also point to the last part of verse 22 that says, The willows of the brook compass him about. The word brook comes from the Hebrew word nechal, which means a stream. By implication in this verse, in this context, it can also mean a narrow valley in which a brook runs. Taking verses 21 and 22, in their proper context, we are told that this animal spends time under lotus trees, which do not grow in swampy terrain, and that the animal spends time in streams. Again, we have the description of an elephant. Young Earth lecturers go to extraordinary effort to make their audiences believe that the reference to reed and fens and the willows of the brook are conveying the idea of a swamp. This is another Young Earth preconceived idea that the seropod dinosaur lived in the swamp. The followers of the Young Earth movement have fallen for this small amount of deceit 
because they haven't done their homework about elephants. Elephants, I didn't know this, but they're amazing swimmers. This elephant was found 16 kilometers out at sea uh, by the Coast Guard and guided back to shore. They have professional snorkeling gear that God has designed, and they do the snorkeling with water in their eyes and water in their mouth, just like the scripture says. Verse 23 is another verse avoided by Ken Ham. This verse also describes an action taken by only one animal on the face of this earth, the elephant. The verse reads, Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. The key words in this verse are draw up. In the original Hebrew text, this term is giach. It is an action verb and it means to labor to bring forth. In its simplest form, it can mean to come forth. In the context of this verse, used with the phrase into his mouth, this is describing the animal picking up water and placing it in its mouth. The animal does this with the use of a tool, his trunk. Young Earth teachers claim that this verse describes the river at the flood stage. And because the seropod dinosaur is so tall, it is confident it will survive even if a flood level reaches its mouth. This interpretation by young earthers is another attempt to fit their preconceived ideas into the biblical text. It is clear to any person who has any knowledge of the Hebrew language that the water in this verse is not rising on its own. The animal is causing the water to move up to its mouth. The term giach indicates that there is an effort on the part of the animal to cause this action. There would not be any effort on the part of the seropod to cause the river to rise. This verse specifically points out the effort on the part of the animal to draw up the water into its mouth. And because giach means to bring forth, this eliminates the possibility that this animal is simply drinking with its mouth. It's bringing up the water to its mouth to drink. This verse is describing an elephant. Now we come to the last verse in the description of Behemoth given to us in Job chapter 40. Not even the forbidden history narrator dares to mention this verse. If there is any doubt in your mind which animal is being described in Job chapter 40, verse 24 should convince you. This verse is avoided like the plague by young earth lectures. So, back to these verses. The river's raging, the behemoth is not disturbed, even though the uh, Jordan's in his mouth, even though the Jordan's in his eyes. Okay, what about 24b here? Or one pierces his nose with a snare. These words have been added by the New King James translators. They didn't understand what uh, the Hebrew is saying, and so they added these words to make it sound like somebody's trying to capture the behemoth. Uh, but here's the KJV. KJV says, he taketh it in his eyes, the water, his nose pierces through snares. In the original text, the word nose is f, which means nostrils. The word pierceth comes from the Hebrew word nochab. It means to perforate, puncture, or to bore. There is one more important word in this verse. The word snare comes from the Hebrew word mochash. It is a trap for catching animals. If you compare the nose of an elephant with the nose of a seropod dinosaur, I think you'll agree that the description given in verse 24 fits an elephant and not a dinosaur. All you have to do is go to the zoo and you can see with your own eyes the elephant's nose piercing through snares. Is there any wonder why young earth lecturers stay as far away from this verse as they possibly can? The reason why Bible notes list an elephant as the creature described in Job chapter 40 is because until the young earth lectures begin changing scripture, most Bible scholars agree that the animal was an elephant. Word biblical commentary again, David Kleins, uh, it's an acceptable translation. Into his mouth with open eyes he receives it, the river water. Alone among the river animals his snout is dry. The anatomy of the sauropod doesn't work for this, but the anatomy of the elephant is perfect. Until young earthers came along, 
and begin modifying the very word of God, no one ever considered that Job 40 was describing a seropod dinosaur. What young earthers are trying to do here is to convince their audiences that they know more than extremely learned Bible scholars. I believe that Ken Ham, Kent Hoven, and every other young earth creationist took their preconceived ideas and blatantly modified and omitted scriptures so their verses fit the description of a dinosaur. Come on, folks. Do you mean to tell me that none of them are aware of verses 23 and 24? I believe the largest animal to get off the ark with Noah was the elephant. And that means dinosaurs weren't there. We have to stay true to the biblical context and not allow our confirmation bias to have us talk about dinosaurs when they don't fit the picture. 2 Corinthians 4 and 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. The elephant is the world's largest land animal. Look at this beast. It truly is a behemoth. Okay, so we've covered the Bible. Let's talk about history. So remember when I told you that some experts believe that dinosaurs were called dragons? I want to show you one of my favorite fossils. Now this is a replica, but it's really cool. Here's what we're going to do. When I uncover this, I want you to yell out the first word that comes into your mind, okay? Are you ready? Here we go. Dracorex. Wow! Now I don't know about you, but when I first saw this, I thought, Dragon. This guy so looks like a dragon, even down to the sharp teeth. So, what kind of dinosaur was this? I'm glad you asked. Check this out. So this one was found in South Dakota, and some experts believe that it was a juvenile pachycephalosaur. But regardless, I think we could agree that this guy looks like a dinosaur. <laughs> So let's talk about history. Are there any historical references to dragons? You know, dinosaurs were amazing. And if people lived alongside of them, it would make sense that they would talk about them or write about them or make drawings or something, right? Well, did they? They did. Check this out. St. George is famous for slaying a dragon. Now, what's really interesting is we can tell from the fossils that this particular one was probably a Nothosaurus. Wow, you talk about a scary creature. Let me get this straight. We can tell from the fossils that this animal walking around on land in this stylized artistic rendering and in every other depiction of St. George's Dragon 2 is really a fully marine Lepidosaur that had lost its ability to walk on land and therefore can't possibly be this same animal. Anothosaurs are not dinosaurs. They lived in the early Triassic before the dinosaurs. They're closer to lizards, but they're not lizards either. They're precursors to plesiosaurs. So even if St. George did kill a nothosaur, it wouldn't help Bisbee's claim that dinosaurs still exist. Of course, there's no fossil that shows what Bisbee says. He's just playing pretend again because that's his job, to make believe things that are not evidently true. St. George's dragon is often, though not always, depicted with wings. What do the fossils tell us this animal was? Well, it's another artist's depiction of the same animal. They're all supposed to be the same dragon from the same story. If there is a kernel of truth to the story at all, then there is one original animal, and all these other renderings are distortions or embellishments of whatever that was. People back then didn't understand anything about zoology. They rendered lots of fictional animals they just made up. But even when they drew real animals, they were still fanciful and mostly imaginary, even if it was supposed to be real. Look at Leviathan, for example. The description in Job 41 fits that of a large crocodile. Now imagine that you're living in the Bronze Age, you're just over five foot tall, and you're armed with only a pointed stick and a short spear of sharpened bronze, and you are inclined or charged to take this on. <laughs> The book of Job, which was written consistent with that image, describes a huge, powerful, yet graceful monster whose mouth is like a set of great doors ringed by fearsome teeth. 
His back has rows of shields tightly sealed together, each so close to the next that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. If you lay a hand on him, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. When he rises up, the mighty are terrified. They retreat before his thrashing. The sword that reaches him has no effect, nor does the spear or the dart or the javelin. Iron he treats like straw and bronze like rotten wood. Arrows do not make him flee. Sling stones are like chaff to him. A club seems to him a piece of straw. He laughs at the rattling of the lance. He makes the depths churn like a boiling cauldron and stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him he leaves a glistening wake. Nothing on earth is his equal, a creature without fear. Before giving any description at all, Job 41 begins by asking his audience questions like, can you draw out Leviathan from a, with a fish hook? Will you play with him as with a bird or put him on a leash for your girls? So it seems that when these parables and poems first became popular, that they were talking about an animal that people had seen themselves and were familiar with. And then they personified it to make it the granddaddy of all such beasts. And then it seems that there was some embellishment done because people always have to exaggerate. And uh, they, they said somewhere in there that it also breathes fire. Now, some people argue that Psalms 1474 says that the Leviathan has multiple heads, but it doesn't say that. If you read the verse just before it, you'll see that they're talking about multiple animals in plural, not just one. I understand that over the centuries people have mythologized this thing, but it really was evidently just a crocodile to begin with. Uh, then when the story got passed into the Mediterranean and into Europe, where you know, places where there were no crocodiles, and people no longer understood what this thing was supposed to be, and this turned into this. Look at this mosaic of a fish. It looks like it could be an oarfish, which is a fairly serpentine fish that can be quite large up to 26 feet long. But it's never as snake-like as this image makes it out to be. There's something similar just below it, implying that it might just be a sea bass or something like that. And look at this one. If these lines between the pectoral fin and the jaw are supposed to be gills, then this is a shark. Even though we know that sharks don't have this body length spinal fin that oarfish actually do have, and some other fish do too, but not sharks. Maybe this isn't a shark because this sea monster is referred to as Cetus, which is a word for whale. And with this pair of dolphins in the background, maybe this is supposed to be an orca or killer whale, even though cetaceans don't have that decorative fin down their spines either. And these are whales too. Remember that people were not good witnesses back then. So this picture is grossly inaccurate, with a baleen whale having teeth as well as feet with clawed toes and other details. But at least they look like mammals, sort of, other than the fact that they have gills. Remember that people back then thought that whales were fish. In the olden days, whalers called them breathing fish. That's why the Bible says that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, but the Bible also says that that fish was a whale. So if St. George's dragon was a real animal, then what was it? Well, the first thing you need to know is that although George was Anglican, he was not an English knight, nor was he in Europe. He encountered his dragon in Libya, in North Africa, and that means that this must be the most accurate depiction of his dragon, because it closely matches an animal that still lives there now, and is still referred to as a dragon to this day. It's a monitor lizard, one of several species of large, long-necked, mildly venomous lizards of the genus Varanus, the largest of which are still called dragons on the island of Komodo in Indonesia. They're not as big in North Africa, but then people weren't quite as big then either which means that this image may well be their largest lizard, the Nile monitor, Varanus niloticus. And it would have been as big compared to George as a Malaysian water monitor is to the average man today. An interesting thing about monitor lizards is that they have forked tongues like snakes. Early depictions of St. George's dragon show that that's obviously what it was, a monitor lizard flicking a forked tongue. But later depictions got a bit more confused when artists started copying each other and without realizing that that's just supposed to be a tongue with two prongs because they keep adding prongs onto it until it looks like it's breathing fire. 
So we started with a lizard, and onto that we added wings, horns, and ears, and sometimes even additional heads, and exaggerated it to ridiculous proportions, just like we do with all of our imagined gods and monsters. And speaking of scary, Alexander the Great and his men were scared by the dragons living in caves. So let's think about this. These men were tough soldiers and fighters. What could scare them? Well, I think a dinosaur could do it. Except that the story doesn't say they were afraid of it. Instead, it says that they were told that this creature was sacred to the Indians and that Alexander's soldiers should leave it alone, which they did. But notice how Bisbee has a manoraptor and dinosaur in his illustration? Without any feathers, which we now know that all of them had. Because Bisbee has to pretend that birds are something different from dinosaurs. So he can't admit feathers on manoraptors, just like he can't admit any of the many facts that disprove all his other assertions, too. More importantly, if you read the story about Alexander and this alleged dragon, it very clearly describes a snake, a gigantic snake, bigger than anything that ever lived, with eyes as big as a Macedonian shield, meaning two feet in diameter, more than twice the size of even the largest eyes known to science, ever. And this same story also talks about other giant snakes in Ethiopia that were supposed to be 60 to 180 feet long. And they're said to eat elephants, like in this picture. We can tell from the fossils that this animal is just a cartoon drawn by somebody who obviously never saw the animal in question and made up his own enhancements to it, like horns and bird's wings and mammalian feet, the way people always did back then. This illustration is a little better. We know that the story is talking about snakes rather than dinosaurs because the same passage also includes a reference to poisonous serpents such as the asp specifically. It also says that baboons are people with the faces of dogs and that they have beards like the beards of male dragons. Now we don't know what animal these authors are talking about here but dinosaurs should not have beards. But then if you ask a medieval European to describe an elephant you get something like this. I mean, these are all so bad. None of them look like the thing they're trying to show. And that's a problem when you try to make up how maybe some of these elephants or snakes are really supposed to be pictures of dinosaurs. The funny thing is, if a big enough snake really did eat an elephant, then at least it would look like a dinosaur. This Roman mosaic shows two long-necked dragons. And this Roman mosaic shows Bellerophon spearing a chimera, which has the head of a goat growing out of the body of a lion, with the head and neck of a snake being used as its tail. Now, what's really interesting is that we can tell from the fossils that this particular one was probably imaginary. This Roman mosaic shows another type of chimera, a hippocampus, which is often described as a dragon. It's a sea monster with the body of a horse and the tail of a fish with the head of a dog and the neck of a snake, but with the wings of a bird. And this one more clearly has the legs of a horse, except that it has bat's wings instead of bird's wings growing out of its elbows or maybe out of its shoulders. But in either case, there would be no musculature there for these limbs to work. And this one is the same, except that it also has the horns of a four-horned sheep. Do we really need to explain that there is nothing like this in the fossil record? because such things as this never existed. And just because somebody drew a picture of it doesn't necessarily mean that it was ever real. And did you know that on the Grand Canyon there are pictographs of dinosaurs? Don't be so stupid. Now what's really interesting is we can tell by the shape and size of this one that it was probably an Amontosaurus. Except that we know better than that. These same people made other pictographs of eagles that are more clear than this one. This is basically the same as the eagle pictograph, except for an erroneously associated line that apparently wasn't meant to be part of this image. So that it looks like a really crappy illustration of Edmontosaurus, which is not at all what these dinosaurs look like. Edmontosaurus was a hadrosaur and looked a lot more like this. The reason this illustration is such crap is that a young earth creationist named Paul Taylor deliberately drew this ridiculously distorted and impossibly contorted kangaroo of a dinosaur trying to shoehorn it or retrofit it into looking like this altered pictograph of an eagle. Because religious apologetics isn't about finding out what's really real. It's about trying to make believe what is not real. Here's another one in Canada. These are all over the world. But there is not even one of them anywhere 
that is what the want of believers make it out to be. For instance, look at this one. It's got this pattern going down the back that looks like the dorsal spines of a dragon or an iguana, but is that what it is? There is no dinosaur like this. This thing has external ears and curved cattle horns and is clearly a mammal. So what are these things on its back? Well, let's compare it to another pictograph with the same affectation. This one looks like a giraffe, doesn't it? And the reason that it does is because this pictograph is from Tanzania, and they have giraffes there. So these serrations down the neck are supposed to represent a mane of hair. So is this one a mane of hair too? Let's compare it to another of these pieces from the same collection at the same location and potentially from the same artist. Well, <laughs> look at this. Remember that these pictographs were dated to the 17th and 18th century, so there were already European settlers there then who probably would have noticed if there were dinosaurs on the western shores of Lake Superior. We're not even talking about pre-Columbian animals, much less prehistoric animals. So what animal was living there then that had curved horns and a hairy mane and a long tail like this? My best guess is that that's supposed to be a bison. And this other supposed dinosaur dragon thing could be a bison too. It's just not drawn very well. Although the natives say it's supposed to be some sort of cat, a panther or lynx that lives underwater and has horns. I don't think they know either what it is, honestly, but whatever the original artist meant for it to be, it could be a bison. It's definitely a mammal, and it's certainly not a dinosaur. This one here is my absolute favorite. Can you see what it is? It appears to be a sauropod surrounded by nine hunters. Incredible! You're right, that's not credible at all. That's probably why all of these dubious claims come without any citations. There is only one source for this assertion. Some young earth creationist blog where this guy says he's the one who found this thing. And while the article he wrote is full of anti-evolution propaganda, there are no details given by which we could look into this, neither to see whether it was independently studied, nor even enough to verify whether it exists at all. I suspect that this guy drew it himself, just like that Peruvian dentist, Javier Cabrera, who paid local natives to etch images of dinosaurs into rocks, which he then artificially aged by soaking them in chicken shit. And then he sold the rocks to tourists as pre-Columbian artifacts, until the scam was found out and exposed. Because, and I should do a video on this, a lot of Christian archaeology is known to be fraudulent. So I have a question for you. If no human has ever seen a dinosaur, then why do we have dragon legends from all over the world? Because people can be stupid and dishonest, given to exaggeration and embellishment, even to the point of faking facts in favor of folklore. When you don't even want to know what the truth is, and are desperate to believe what you know ain't so. Why do we have paintings and carvings and drawings and statues of what we would call dinosaurs? We don't. We have authentic drawings of other things that are mistaken for, misrepresented as, or forcibly distorted into dinosaurs, like this Sumatran rhino cast against the background of large leaf foliage that believers pretend must be the plates of a stegosaurus. But Stegosaurs didn't have external ears, or hooves, or spindly little tails like rhinos did have. And we also have supposed dinosaur carvings and fake footprints and such that are deliberately dishonest hoaxes intended to fool people. But the only actual renderings of dinosaurs were all based on fossils, not sightings of living animals. And why do we have writings which seem to describe encounters between humans and dinosaurs? Because some people are so credulous, so desperate to defend their faith in an impossibly young earth, that they will accept any excuse to make believe that whenever a fable talks about a lizard or a snake, then that's just got to be a dinosaur, even when the story clearly illustrates what it really is. Well, I think the answer is quite simple. People lived with dinosaurs, just like the Bible says. Except that the Bible doesn't say that, Bisbee. You only think it does because you are quite simple. You wouldn't know a dinosaur if you ate one, and you have, several times. And you never recognized it, proving the point. The only dinosaurs that you or anyone else have ever seen alive were birds. So did dinosaurs evolve into birds? Yes. I mean, we hear that all the time, right? Obviously. So if you're going to become a bird, I think the first thing you need to think about is, okay, I need feathers except that evolution is an emergent pattern at the population level, 
not a deliberate decision by any individual. And many, if not most, lineages of dinosaurs already had feathers before they were birds. Here's the thing. Feathers are incredibly complicated. They show design. They show incidental design as determined by successive generations of trial and error pitted against natural selection. When you look at them under the microscope, you see all kinds of really cool features. For example, these barbs that help hold the different parts of the feather together, well, there's a corresponding part on a bird beak. He uses that to realign the feathers so that they don't get ruffled. It helps him fly. So if evolution's true, which evolved first, the barbs and the feather, or the tool on the beak. The barbs on the feather evolved first. Obviously, that wouldn't make much sense, right? Of course it does, because back then most dinosaurs didn't have beaks, and instead they had to groom their feathers with their teeth. If you have feathers but you don't have a beak, then you can't adapt your beak for grooming your feathers. You have to use your teeth. Obviously, somebody really smart made those birds. It can't be obvious if it's not even apparent. No one made those birds, nor is that even possible. We know they evolved. But if they were magically created instead, then we must assume that this mystical genie who made them also made those dinosaurs with several different types of feathers, some of which don't even exist anymore. Because all those animals went extinct, and not because they couldn't figure out how to groom their feathers without a beak. So if there was a god who created them, and it was somebody completely negligent who wiped them all out with an impact from space. We know that it wasn't from a global flood because we have proof that the global flood never happened. But if it did happen, then that would prove that this God was not only negligent, but cruel and stupid too. And feathers are just the beginning. If Dinosaurs and birds are completely different creatures. They have different lungs and different circulation systems, different skeletons, everything. I'll include a link below to a three hour long 10 part playlist I made with the help of a professional paleontologist with expertise in Peruvian dinosaurs, wherein we show that birds and dinosaurs share exactly the same respiration, circulation, a suite of uniquely distinct skeletal features, everything. All these traits that are specific to, and thus diagnostic of, dinosaurs. Traits shared by nothing else except birds. And birds share every one of these exact same traits, which is why birds are dinosaurs. The same way that lions are cats and iguanas are lizards, birds are the last surviving subset of dinosaurs. The problem is, evolution can't do that. Now we're going to talk more about that on our episode on evolution. I really hope you join us. Oh, I will. I can't wait for that one. I'm sure it'll be a bucket of chuckles. But when you do that one, Bisbee, you really should have me on as a consultant so that some of the things you say might be right for once. Because so far, you're always wrong on every point, every time. Because it's obvious that you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, ever. And you only seem interested in misleading innocent children who deserve to know better. So, you really should hire someone to teach you before you upload another video embarrassing yourself like this. I'd be happy to help. Okay, well, what about this? I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Archaeopteryx. Supposedly, he is a transitional fossil between dinosaurs and birds. Well, Archaeopteryx did fulfill one of Darwin's predictions, that if evolution is true, and only if evolution is true, then we should find an animal that is not quite a fully fledged bird, but isn't just a reptile the way they used to define that either, but is somewhere between the two. And Archaeopteryx was only the first of dozens of intermediates to fit that description. But you know what? Even evolutionists say that he was nothing more than a bird. No. Evolutionists do not say that. Or rather, the only ones who do are John Rubin, Larry Martin, and Alan Fiducia, who was quoted here, all of whom made a pact way back in the 1980s that they would defend the false belief that birds are not dinosaurs. And that agreement requires that they ignore or reject any and all evidence that might ever arise showing that birds are, in fact, dinosaurs. But now we've proven that they are, and the band have proven that they're dishonest, and they need to desist, having lost this argument conclusively, years ago. Okay then, what happened to the dinosaurs? How did they go extinct? 
cigarettes. Don't smoke anything. Okay, seriously now, what does the Bible say happened? That doesn't matter because none of the mere fallible people involved in concocting, composing, compiling, editing, and interpolating those fables had any idea what a dinosaur is. So we learn in Genesis that after Adam and Eve sinned, the world became a very dark place. People and animals were running around fighting and killing each other. It was awful. It was always that way, the way it still is now. People are animals in that we are multicellular eukaryotes with an internal digestive tract, such that we have to ingest and digest other organisms in order to survive. If there is a God, then it's his fault that we are that way, where plants can make their own food, but we cannot. And the world was never such a dark place, but it was never a paradise either. There was always competition between predator and prey. There was never a Garden of Eden, no talking snake, no magically enchanted fruit, and no Adam and Eve. Just like there was no Beauty and the Beast, no Paul Bunyan, nor Gulliver, nor Icarus. They are all just characters from stories, fictional fables. They are not real. In fact, it was so bad that God decided to send a global flood to wipe everything out. I would say, cool story, bro, but it's not a cool story. It's horrific. An awful tale of unreasonable hatred, blind cruelty, and bigoted stupidity and injustice on behalf of your God. Only Noah and his family and the land animals that were on the ark survived. What this means, that according to the Bible, most of the dinosaurs were wiped out in a global flood. No, because the non-avian dinosaurs were already wiped out tens of millions of years before imaginative storytellers made up these fables in the Bible and other myths that you foolishly still believe, without reason and against all reason. So, okay, is if that's true, well, wouldn't that mean that there were some dinosaurs on the ark? If so, Bisbee, then you should explain why, according to that same fable, the dinosaurs and all those other prehistoric families of animals should still be alive today. Well, here's what God said. God said that he would send two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground to Noah to be kept alive on the ark. And yet they all died. All the dinosaurs, pterosaurs, phytosaurs, pelicosaurs, Cotylosaurs, crocodilomorphs, anapsids, therapsids, alotheres, triconodonts, meridiungulates, mesonychids, and so many other diverse varieties of life. Everything that should have been kept alive died immediately because God failed to provide for or protect them. Basically, the vast majority of everything that ever lived, God failed to keep alive on the ark. And that's to say nothing of the marine animals like the mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, ammonites, trilobites, placoderms, placodonts, desmostylians, transitional whales, and innumerable other animal families that we just have to pretend never existed if we want to make believe in this unbelievably silly story of Noah that we know is just a story. So yes, according to the Bible, there were some dinosaurs on the ark. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. Well, well, wait a minute. How in the world would they fit? We just got done talking about how big the Brachiosaurus and some of the other ones were. There is an answer. Let's take a closer look. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen a cute little bathtub arc like this. And, you know, it's cute. All the animals are smiling and so on. And somebody's got some pretty good talent, good, good at drawing. Here's the problem. This ark looks nothing like the real ark. The real ark was absolutely huge. There was no real ark. It's like Cinderella's pumpkin coach, or Aladdin's magic carpet, or Santa's sleigh. It's a fantasy, not real. But what was that weird edit with the dragon just now? Let's play that again. This ark looks nothing like the real ark. What was that about? The real ark was absolutely huge. It was 510 feet long, 84 feet wide, and as tall as a four-story building. Oh yeah? Well, Godzilla's bigger than that. 
since 1954, he has grown to 393 feet tall, 582 feet long, and weighs over 99,000 tons. Of course, since he's not real either, then I guess it doesn't really matter how big the story says he is, right? You know, if Godzilla was real, he wouldn't be able to function. He would collapse under his own weight, and so would Noah's Ark. The largest wooden ship ever was a fraction of the size of the Ark, and it twisted in half because it was too big, exceeding the stress limitations of a wooden boat, even in its relatively calm seas, which we know would not be the case for Noah's Ark, being in the most violent seas imaginable, especially being overloaded with so many more tons of cargo as well as several more tons of perishable food without refrigeration or preservatives and however many thousands of gallons of drinking water because you know you can't lower a bucket over the side into that churning mass of toxic death that they were floating on. Now this picture was taken at the Ark Encounter in Kentucky. If you ever get a chance, you have got to go see this. I've been. I walked through the Ark alongside Bill Nye and Ken Ham. And sometimes when I wasn't walking beside them, you can see me in the background where I got to deconvert believers. So sad to see grown people misled with such nonsense. They have a full-size replica of the Ark. They have a full-size replica of Godzilla, too, in Japan, and you can ride zip lines into its mouth. But sadly, that doesn't mean that either Godzilla or the Ark are real, no matter how much we might wish that it was. And come to think of it, you can't have a replica of something that never existed. And just to give you an idea how big this is, you see that circle down on the right-hand side? Those two little dots? Those are people. The real Ark was huge. It was so big that Answers in Genesis couldn't build it as an Ark. It's just a regular concrete and steel building, but with a wooden facade, which they made to look like a boat. But it wasn't supposed to be a boat. The story said it was a box, not a boat. It's an Ark. So, if it was real... It wouldn't have had a keel, because it doesn't have any means of steering or propulsion. And in a comedy of irony, this fake facade suffered nearly a million dollars in water damage from flooding. Even though it's on dry land, not even floating. If it was floating, it would rip itself to pieces, even though it had huge steel rivets everywhere, which of course they wouldn't have had 5,000 years ago. Ken Ham knew when he built this museum of ignorance that he couldn't build it right not even with hundreds of workers using modern trucks and cranes and power tools. So they just should have hired one 600-year-old man and his three sons working by themselves using hand axes from the Stone Age, right? There's not a bit of this story that anyone should or could honestly believe. There was plenty of room for the animals, including the dinosaurs on board. There are more genera represented in the fossil record than exist today. All the species alive today represent only about 1% of everything that has ever lived. And what we have alive on Earth today is already too much for the Ark. It really is. So if you try to shoehorn everything that ever lived into that mythic menagerie all at the same time, then we're talking about a hundred times too much. With several hundred species of dinosaurs, as well as several hundred more species within numerous other diverse groups that you've never even heard of, that only paleontologists know about. Because most people's knowledge of paleofauna is limited to only a few plastic pieces they've seen in a prehistoric playset, but there were legions more than that, showing generations of successive ages of biodiversity across geologic history, all of which bibliolaters like Bisbee have to ignore or simply pretend that they don't exist. Now here's another thing to think about. There were only about 80 kinds of dinosaurs, and most of them were no bigger than a pony when they were full grown. So, again, no problem putting them on that huge arc. There's no such thing as a kind. The definition given in the Bible is when two animals are closely related enough that they can still interbreed and bring forth fertile offspring after their kind. But that's the same definition as the biological species concept. And paleontologists have identified what should be well over 700 distinct species of dinosaurs within hundreds of different genera. And again, that's just the dinosaurs. That's not everything else in the Mesozoic that was alive alongside them, nor anything else in the Cenozoic prior to what we have now, nor from the Paleozoic just before the age of the dinosaurs, which was just as diverse, and any one of these eras alone exceeds the capacity of your mythic boat. Well, what about the big ones, like the Brachiosaurus? There's an answer. So we know from the fossil record 
from different things that we found that even the huge dinosaurs started out small. We have found Brachiosaurus eggs, and they're about no bigger than a football or so. Besides, it would make a lot of sense to take babies on board. They're smaller, they weigh less, they eat less, they sleep more, they're tougher. And who would you rather clean up after, Junior or Grandpa? You'd need a bulldozer to clean up after Grandpa. Yuck! The Ark Encounter has a few cages of some nicely rendered stuffed animals, but they wanted to house an actual zoo, or at least a petting zoo. But they realized early on that they couldn't do it, that they had to have stuffed animals instead because of restricted airflow and the overpowering stench of feces. Even though the modern replica had an air conditioning system with huge ducts for ventilation. Now remember that the so-called real Ark wouldn't have had any of that and that they were only allowed one window, and that Noah's family would be frantically shoveling shit out of that one window until they all died of methane poisoning, which would have taken less than an hour after closing the main door, if they held out that long. You know, after dinosaurs got off the ark, it was really hard for them to find food, so many of them starved to death and went extinct. Then God failed to preserve them, because they all died immediately or shortly thereafter. And Bisbee would have us believe that God had a divine plan to march all these animals onto the ark to be kept alive, only for 90% of them to die as soon as they got off again, proving that God is neither omniscient nor infallible. Or, if there is a God and he is omniscient and infallible, then this story isn't about him, this story is just made up. A lot of the other ones got into fights with people, and that's where all the different dragon legends and the artifacts came from. No, that is where exactly none of these legends came from, and we can prove that as easily as reading any of these original stories that all make pretty clear that they're talking about something else. Okay, so we've covered the Bible. We've talked about historical references. Let's talk about the fossil evidence. So what is the fossil record? The fossil record is billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the world. Usually, but not always. That's not the only way. For example, look at the La Brea tar pits, which have preserved hundreds and hundreds of Pleistocene and Holocene mammals, as well as giant vultures from that time, but otherwise, no dinosaurs. Not a one. Nor anything else that was already associated with earlier geologic periods. And creationists can't even acknowledge that fact, much less explain it. We have found massive graveyards that have, guess what? dinosaur fossils in them. Now this one here in Utah has over 2,000 bones, 11 different kinds of dinosaurs. But not even one modern eutherian mammal, nor any other species common to that area today. Nor did they find any Paleozoic species either, even from the Mesozoic. There was nothing from the Triassic or Cretaceous, only things like Stegosaurus, Apatosaurus, Diplodocus, Allosaurus, all species commonly associated with the late Jurassic. And they're all in this jumbled mess mixed in with crocodiles, turtles, lizards, frogs, and get this, clams. Now wait a minute, don't clams live in the water? They do. Yeah, just like the turtles, crocodiles, and frogs you just mentioned. Yeah, that's one of a few ways that they know that 149 million years ago, there was a river system here that fed into what was left of the Sundance Sea that until that time covered most of Utah. That's why each of these 74 individual dinosaurs, as well as each of the crocodilians and so on that were found in the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, are all from the late Jurassic. Just like everything from the La Brea Tar Pits came from the late Pleistocene at the earliest. But confirmation bias means believers are going to ignore every inconvenient fact. Here's another one to think about. Up in Hilda, Canada, you can go see this dinosaur park. They have thousands of buried centrosaurs. These are big, powerful creatures. Thousands of them. Now, even the evolutionists admit that these guys drowned, but they say it was a river overflowing. But does that make sense to you? Of course. We see herds of animals trying to cross rivers this way still today. If the river is overflowing, then they're all doomed. Thousands of these creatures, these big, powerful creatures, drowned it by a river? Hmm, I think something else did that. No, you don't think at all. You believe. You're so desperate to believe what the facts do not indicate that you ignore what they do indicate. 
Thus you forget that just a couple centuries ago, vast herds of bison could stretch over whole states. So we should expect something similar back when the centrosaurs were here in the late Cretaceous, 75 million years ago. In fact, if you go to different dinosaur parks all throughout North America and you read the signs, it's amazing how many times you'll see that they were killed in a flood. Not the flood, but many different types of inundations in different areas at different times, from overflowing rivers to tsunamis to storm surge and mudslides and so on. Or, and or they were buried with shark teeth or clams or different types of marine fossils. What could do that? Well, a global flood. I'll put a link below to an eight-part series I did explaining how various sciences all disprove Noah's flood. I don't want to repeat all that here. Just understand that this was at the height of the Western Interior Seaway. I know because I've been on the excavated remains of that shore to see where thousands upon thousands of ammonite shells had washed up on what was then a beach. Terrestrial fossils on this side, marine fossils on that side, sandstone beneath, what else could it be? Now, fossils usually require water, and any dinosaur killed by storm surge or tsunami is going to be associated with other marine artifacts. However, I discovered one of these boneyards myself on an expedition in South Africa, where Permian animals like anapsids and therapsids were washed up together in a jumbled mess. But it was a desert environment, then as now, making flash floods especially deadly surprises. So there were no marine fossils to be found. There weren't any dinosaurs either, nor any mammals for that matter, because this was Permian strata, dated to 263 million years old, long before mammals or dinosaurs. Another clue is when we do find intact skeletons of dinosaurs. Don't say we find intact skeletons when you've never done any paleontology. And don't say that you have another clue when it's obvious you still don't have the first clue. A lot of them look like they drowned. A lot of them did drown, but obviously not all of them. They have their neck and their head arched back like this one. In fact, scientists call this the death pose. And what paleontologists say about that is that either this opisthonic contortion was caused at the time of death by a spasm brought on by poisoning or a lack of oxygen to the brain, or it happens after death with immersion in water or decay, tensioning muscles and ligaments that pull the head back and pull the tail up. Even the mighty T-Rex drowned. Now let's think about this. What could drown something as big and powerful as a T-Rex? Well, I think you know. Flash flood overflowing river, storm surge, tsunami, mudslides, assuming that it drowned at all because it could be a paramortem or postmortem pose, meaning that however it died, if it ended up in an aquatic environment to become fossilized, then it might have chemically contorted to assume that position anyway. We even had dinosaurs buried together with fish. Flash flood, overflowing water, storm surge, tsunami, mudslides, and volcanic activity like poisoned or superheated water. We have millions of sea creatures and millions of land creatures all buried together. What could do that? Flash flood of a dry gully, overflowing river, storm surge, tsunami, mudslides, things that commonly happen everywhere and not something impossible that couldn't and didn't happen ever like. Well, a global flood, just like the Bible teaches. Except that the Bible teaches that the flood reached a depth of 15 cubits, which is not enough to flood the whole world, but it was enough to inundate the entire Iraqi floodplain, just like the Bible described. And archaeologists have confirmed that such a flood did in fact happen, and that this is likely where your flood legend came from. Around 2900 BCE, some guy named Ziasudra was punting a conical ark down the Euphrates River, taking his livestock to market when the river massively overflowed its banks and washed him helplessly into the Persian Gulf. And that story was rehashed in the epics of Gilgamesh and Abderhassus and exaggerated the way all popular stories are after being retold often enough. Such that the low hills became high mountains and they reached the final exaggeration that any flood story can. Eventually they exaggerated to the point that it flooded the whole world because they thought that the world was flat back then and contained within a firmament that would let the rain in from their idea of outer space, which was an eternal abyss of water. And now we know that no part of that story is plausible or possible, and we've disproved it every way that anything can be disproved. But that, as I said, is a different conversation 
we were supposed to be talking about dinosaurs. So, you know, if you go to a museum, you'll see signs that say that, you know, the fossil record proves that dinosaurs evolved and died out millions of years ago. Should I point out your own image of these modern Cenozoic animals? Some of which you might find in the La Brea Tar Pits, but you'll never find any of these alongside Cretaceous centrosaurs, nor with any Jurassic dinosaurs, nor with Permian therapsids either. And I'm sure you already know why that is, but you won't think about that, because you just got to pretend in defense of your favorite fantasy. Well, check this out. In 2005, scientists announced that they had found something amazing inside of a T-Rex thigh bone. They found soft tissue, blood vessels, blood cells. How could that be still there if these fossils were truly 70 million years old? Because they didn't find any actual blood vessels or blood cells. When we say that we found dinosaur bones, we don't mean that we found their actual bones. We only found the lithified remains of those things, where the organic material has been slowly and incrementally replaced by heavier materials like stone. But vertebrate blood is based on iron, which is pretty heavy already. So if you have a large enough bone, very well insulated, it is possible that there might be microscopic remnants of blood cells, the iron-based compound called heme. It's literally the fossil of the blood cell. The only way associated structures can be made flexible again is by soaking them in an acid bath for weeks to demineralize them, which is a bit like unfossilizing them. Without this acidic soaking, you wouldn't find anything soft about them. You know, that wasn't the only place that they found soft tissue. In fact, when they went back and started looking at fossils that they already had, they found a lot of different examples of soft tissues even things like collagen and other things that couldn't possibly be there if these fossils were truly millions of years old. My friend Erica has a textbook from another creationist, one with education in this area, and who should know better. Erica? So I whipped out our good friend Fuzz Rana's book. This is Dinosaur Blood in the Age of the Earth. You can buy it on Amazon. You should. It's quite good. Uh, and Fuzz is indeed quite qualified to write a text like this because he has a PhD in chemistry with an emphasis on biochem. So he really knows what he's talking about. And um, he's got a lot on what uh, Dan, uh, Dan Biddle and the boys were just talking about. So first discussing the structure of collagen. So collagen is a fibrous protein biomolecule, bio rather. It, it has a triple helix as its kind of base structure, base structural unit that consists of three long extended protein chains that wrap around each other. And then these guys twist together to create collagen fibrils, which twist together to create collagen fibers, as you can see in this diagram here. Fuzz says uh, of, the, <laughs> of the collagen, he says, this property, that being the intertwining of protein chains and fibrils along extensive cross-linking between the collagen chains, uh, which makes it incredibly durable, uh, it, it makes it well suited for connective tissues in animals as well as for preservation. So one thing that he notes here is that um, the, the, the collagen fibers have a lot of contact points. So because of these contact points, it's very difficult to degrade when compared to other kind of uh, less knit together um, biomolecules. Even if individual protein strands break down, the fiber remains largely intact because of these association points. Once the protein strand breaks, the fragments are held in close proximity by these contact points. Uh, this forced closeness allows for broken strands to occasionally rejoin and reform the original protein. If the broken strands were not held juxtaposed to each other, the fragments would diffuse away from one another, thus preventing the reversal of the degradation process. So not only is it hard to degrade, but if it isn't entirely degraded, it can actually reform bonds, which makes it incredibly durable uh, and difficult to get rid of, to purge from, from samples. I should add that Bisbee showed a cleverly edited video of Dr. Mary Schweitzer, the paleontologist who discovered soft tissue in dinosaur fossils. She was a young earth creationist before she began working in that lab, and now she's not. She still identifies as a complete and total conservative evangelical Christian, but she's no longer a creationist. And now that she understands what evolution is, what the evidence for it is, and how it works, she no longer sees it as a threat to her faith. But she has also complained about young earth creationists like Bisbee and Genesis Apologetics who have misquoted and misrepresented her data to mislead their audience. Bisbee, your source is calling you out. She says you're being dishonest. So let's wrap up. 
Here's what the Bible says about dinosaurs. Not a damn thing. <laughs> yeah, this